Good afternoon. Uh, my name is KP Ifetaba, uh, co-president of the Black Law Students Association here at BC Law. Uh, thank you to the Rappaport Center for inviting the Black Law Student Association to be a part of this event. Uh, BLSA has had the great fortune to collaborate with the Rappaport Center on several events this year already on topics ranging from reparations to zoning and equity. We look forward to future opportunities to engage in these critical conversations with the BC law community. If you're interested in similarly important conversations, please join the Black Law Students Association for its annual spring conference Saturday, April 9th, here at BC Law with our theme, Our Canvas, Painting a New Boston, where we'll discuss the challenges and opportunity of strengthening the Black community here in our city. Also, the Rappaport Center's next two programs will focus on environmental justice and will welcome senior fellow in residence, Jeremy Orr, Director of Litigation and Advocacy Partnerships at Earth Justice. Please visit the center's website to learn more and register. Now on to today's program entitled Justice Delayed, Not Justice Denied, the prosecutions of the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing that killed four little girls, Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, and Carol Denise McNair. I have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished lecturer and former U.S. Senator, Doug Jones, the Jerome Lyle Rappaport Distinguished Visiting Professor this semester, who brought long overdue justice to the victims of the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing while serving as U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Alabama from 1997 to 2001. Senator Jones has built his career on fighting impossible battles. In 2017, Senator Jones shocked the political establishment by winning a special election to fill a U.S. Senate seat in Alabama, the first Democrat to do so in 25 years in the state. As the only statewide federally elected Democrat in the Deep South during his term, Senator Jones gave hope for the first time in a generation to an overlooked but growing demographic of Americans. As a lifelong resident of Birmingham, Alabama, I had the pleasure of casting a vote in his favor myself, and I'd like to thank him for paving the way for more progressive candidates to come into office uh, in traditionally conservative Southern strongholds. He's had a distinguished public sector career, uh, serving as staff counselor to, to the US Senate Judiciary Com Committee, as assistant United States attorney, taking a brief detour to work in a law firm and then returning to the public sphere as United States attorney for the Northern District of Alabama, having been nominated by President Bill Clinton. While serving in that position, Senator Jones successfully prosecuted two of the four men responsible for the 1963 bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church that killed four young girls, finally bringing full justice and closure nearly 40 years after the attack. His book, Bending Toward Justice, the Birmingham Church Bombing that Changed the Course of Civil Rights, provides a look behind the scenes of that long landmark prosecution. Senator Jones is a graduate of the University of Alabama and the Cumberland School of Law at Sanford University in Birmingham. He currently serves as counsel at the law firm Aaron Fox and is a distinguished senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, focusing his work on issues of racial justice and equality, voting rights, and law enforcement reform. Most notably, Senator Jones was appointed by President Biden to lead the nomination process for the newly announced Supreme Court Justice nominee. We'll reserve about 15 minutes at the end of the program for Q&A. For virtual participants, please submit your questions using Q&A chat function. Lastly, I'd like to note that this event is being recorded and box lunches will be served at the conclusion of the event. Please welcome Senator Doug Jones. Well, thank you. Thank you. Everybody here okay? All right. So can you see these photos? Can you see that okay? Because I want to make sure this the real story is up here. Um, so thank you. It's great to be here. It's been kind of crazy for me since I joined the faculty. Um, no one at home believes I'm a law professor. <laughs> I have trouble myself, but it has been a wonderful experience, even though with the new role at the White House, it's been a little crazy for me the last couple, three weeks, you can probably imagine. And the White House ethics people make me say at the beginning of this that I do not speak in this for the administration. This I'm just here as Doug Jones and your distinguished professor, which my wife still chokes up at every time I hear it. Um, before I start, though, I, you know, this is a pretty um, amazing run for me uh, with this uh, 
case. And I love to talk to lawyers and to law students about it. But I also like to talk about a little bit of levity, especially with, with law students, because you will find in the practice of law, there is often so much when you get clients in and they talk to you about their case and they leave and you go, what the hell were they thinking about whatever it was? And so I've got a visual to show you about what they were, what the hell were they thinking? Because at one point a few years ago, the Los, Ange uh, Los Angeles, the LA uh, Angels and the Chicago White Sox were playing in Chicago. And the White Sox, it was scheduled to rain a little bit. So the White Sox had this great idea that they would give away ponchos to the first however many people that came. And they gave away these ponchos. And so during the game, it started raining and people put their ponchos on. And this was the photograph behind center field. It was like the grand dragon of the Klan was having his birthday celebration at the White Sox game. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, history, the law, um, and quite frankly, a kind of a personal journey, because they're all wrapped up into this story. Uh, it is history because what happened in Birmingham, uh, and particularly on September 15th, 1963, was one of the most hor horrific acts of the civil rights era. Uh, it is part of Birmingham's history, but more importantly, it's part of America's history. And you will see that. But I was nine years old when that bomb blew up. And in those days, folks, everything was segregated. It was up here in Boston. It was in other places, but particularly in the South. And my neighborhood was no exception. My little city in Fairfield, Alabama was no exception. White schools and black schools, white churches, black churches. Very rarely was there uh, any type of um, integration of the races, except in just in passing. Uh, that all began to change dramatically in 1963. And what we saw in Birmingham was an incredible movement. And 1963, in part, was Birmingham's year. I called it the year of the child, and you'll understand why, but it's really the year of Birmingham because so much happened in my city uh, during that time frame. And it was things that ultimately helped change the direction of this country. As a nine-year-old, I wasn't involved. I will tell you that I spent more of my time in Fairfield, which is about eight to 10 miles west of Birmingham, worrying about the World Series and worrying about college football, roll tide from my Tennessee, I mean, my Texas student in my class. Um, that's what you did when you're a white kid in the South and not, you're nine years old in 1963. My world was so different than the world of the children that were going to go to Sunday school on September 5th, 15th, 1963. And so what you will see today is a story because this is, as a trial lawyer, as a prosecutor, I wanted to tell this story to my jury, a story that talks about the civil rights movement, a story that talks about these families and the children, and it talks about the terror that they went through on September 15th. So we put this case together, but at the same time, it is also a story of reconciliation and redemption. It's also a story of justice delayed, but not justice denied. It's a story, I think, um, that transcends so much uh, of what is good in America, ultimately. It took us a, a long time. And for me, it's really a, a, a lot of connect the dots. Because for me, I was a second year law student in Birmingham when the first of these cases was tried. People forget, they, they remember more about my cases because they're so recent, but the first of these cases was tried in 1977. A fellow named uh, Robert Chambliss, known as Dynamite Bob, went on trial. The Alabama Attorney General, Bill Baxley, uh, put him on trial for the murder of Denise McNair in this bombing and convicted him. 
sentenced him to prison where he died in prison a few years later. As a second year law student, I cut my classes to go watch that trial because I wanted to be a trial lawyer. I don't know where your, your law practice will take you. I wanted to be a trial lawyer. And I had the good fortune one time to spend a day with a late Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas, who told me that if you want to be a good trial lawyer, you should go watch trials. Go watch really good lawyers do what they do best. Don't try to imitate them, but just watch them and understand. So when I had the opportunity to see some really great trial lawyering in Birmingham, I took it. I can't remember what classes that I cut. Probably didn't matter anyway, given my academics. But I saw an amazing trial. Never, ever dreaming at that point that 24 years later, I would have an opportunity to do the second and third of those trials in the same courtroom where I watched from the balcony as a kid. So you can tell, and I'd also known one of the families, the McNair family. So a lot of this is, there's a, there's a really personal. And you can understand how I felt this past Friday in the White House, literally in the room 20 feet away from the President of the United States, who I've also known for 40 years, introducing the first African-American woman to be on the United States Supreme Court. It was, yeah. So all of these things are rolled into one. But I, what I want to do today is focus on really the trial and to try to show you how we pull this case together after so many years. I was, I was appointed in 1997 and we started working on this case. Um, a lot of people were dead. A lot of people were dying and elderly, but we were committed and we pull this case together. And so what you will see from this is a story. We had two trials. We had a fellow named Tommy Blanton and the other was named Bobby Frank Cherry. So I'm going to show you a little bit about both of these trials. Some of, the, some of which the evidence was the same. The evidence with Blanton was a little bit different than the evidence against Cherry but they all come to the same conclusion. And we tried, we wanted to try the cases together, but there was an issue about Bobby Cherry's competency to stand trial, not an insanity defense or a diminished capacity defense, but really his competency, whether or not he understood what was going on. He had had a couple of heart attacks and he had an expert saying he was just, he didn't understand. We proved he was faking it, but that's a different issue. I could spend a whole day talking about him. But we divided the cases. We tried the first case in uh, April and May of 2001, and the second one against Cherry in 2002 after the judge ruled him competent to stand trial. So we're going to put these together, and we'll talk about how they all came together in a courtroom for a jury. And for me, this case always started not just with the families and the victims. Uh, but with the church itself. The 16th Street Baptist Church is still one of the most amazing places uh, to go. It is a vibrant church. Uh, I go there and visit ever so often. Uh, it is, it, and this is a photograph. Now, this photograph's about 20 years old now because you'll see I used it as state's exhi is exhibit number one. You'll see some of these stickers that I used in a number of, of these. Some of, I've gotten off so you can see better, but a lot of these photographs that I'm going to show you were used uh, in the trial itself. So you start with the church because that's where so much happened in the civil rights community during the civil rights era. It still does, to be honest, but the, you start with the church and the church today is very similar in, in its outside structure, the way it was in 1963. This is an older photograph of in 1963 that we used. And you can see the church is basically the same with one exception. If you look very closely right here, you'll see some steps that led from this sidewalk up to the back door of the church that led into the sanctuary. And those steps hadn't been there since September the 15th, 1963, when a bomb exploded just after someone had placed it underneath the very first step. 
So you start with the church and the focal point, but make no mistake, the families were a huge part of this story. And we tried to make sure the families had the opportunities that they had been denied for so long. And so one of the first witnesses that we called was Miss Alpha Robertson. Her daughter, Carol, was one of the girls killed in this blast. Miss Robertson was an amazing lady, just absolutely in incredible. And she, she had left behind and stayed at home to get ready for church that morning. Carol went early to Sunday school and to get ready. Because see, this was going to be a youth worship service. Now, I don't know how many of you have attended. Some of you may have even been involved in youth worship service where the youth of the church conduct the entire service. That's what was going to happen that day. And Carol was going to be a part of that. And Ms. Robertson stayed behind at home, and they lived about six blocks from the church. And I called her to the stand, and she set this stage. Her husband had taken her. And I said, what happened? Tell me what you heard. And she said, well, I'm getting ready. And there was just incredible loud explosion that it sounded like the whole world was shaking. And truly, that's what happened. The whole world did shake after this bomb in Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham, a city of violence at the time. Uh, but this killed four young girls, innocent young girls, on a Sunday morning in a house of worship and people all over the world asking why. The reverberations of this bomb were el else everywhere. And the questions have never really been fully answered. Even with the convictions, the, the answers to all the questions have never been fully answered. But Ms. Robertson set the tone, set the tone that the whole world uh, was shaking. But as a lawyer, I'm trying to figure out how the best way to show the motive to prove what I could not prove through the mouse and the evidence that I had to try to set a tone to tell a story. And so when I was doing this case, when we started working on it, all of the evidence was still in Birmingham, thousands of pages in, in, uh, that they had in any number of places. But I also wanted to look at really what was happening around the country and in Birmingham and the South in particular. And what I determined, what it was so obvious to me was that all of this really started back in 1954 in the Brown versus Board of Education decision, which you have, if you haven't studied it yet, you will. That was the decision in which the Supreme Court of the United States said separate schools are inherently unequal. They are unconstitutional. The separate but equal doctrine is no longer applicable. And in a separate case, they said, schools should desegregate with all deliberate speed. Well, that didn't happen. Even with great lawyering, it took a long time. But in 1957, one of the leaders of the, of, of the movement in Birmingham, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, decided he was going to test this case. This was going to be his test in Birmingham. Fred was a brave man, unbelievable guy. He was the leader in the South. And if you haven't read about Fred Shuttlesworth, you should, because there are so many people that think that without a Fred Shuttlesworth, there wouldn't have been a Martin Luther King. He was active from the very beginning. And in 1957, he decided to test the Brown decision. And he went to Phillips High School in downtown Birmingham, which was one of the most prominent white high schools in the state, and to enroll his kids. He had two kids that he was going to enroll. He and his wife rolled up. And he was met with an angry mob. Now, there happened to be a young man who worked at the TV station as an intern. And he had just graduated Phillips, and he was going to college, and he went to Phillips that day to get a copy of his transcript to take to college. And he had with him a movie camera. This is not the video stuff that you guys are used to, but an old 8-millimeter movie camera that your parents or grandparents may have had when they're kids. And he saw this mob, and this young man said, you know, something's happening here. And he went and got that camera, and he caught on film what happened to Fred. And I'm going to try to show it. Now, this, I hope this plays. We haven't tested this part. I hope it plays. If it doesn't, I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll stop it. But 
I want you to watch carefully if it plays and it's not. Okay. It's okay. I want to show you a couple of things. You see Fred Shuttlesworth, Cindy, we forgot to download that video. I was focused on the audio, but it's okay. This is a video. You see Doc, uh, Fred Shuttlesworth there on the left, and his wife is with him. This mob beat him, kicked him, almost broke his wrist. His wife was stabbed with a pocket knife in her hip. But as part of this, it wasn't just the beating that took place and the mob of people. But there up in the right-hand corner, you see the face of a gentleman, and that's being very kind, with a cigarette in his mouth, right above the word play. Well, what we determined after looking at this video, and I'm sorry I can't play it, we messed it up, because you'll see him coming around, and you'll see that guy with a cigarette actually move out of the picture, come around, reach in his pocket, and then get back into the fracas with Fred Shuttlesworth. And what he was doing, he was reaching for brass knuckles. Because the man up there ab above that, if you can't, you might not can see him real well, was Bobby Frank Cherry, one of the guys that I prosecuted. He had no kids in that school, but felt compelled to violence to stop school integration. And we all know that school integration was one of the things that caused most of the racial violence, including here in Boston at the time. But that's what occurred. It's not going to, it's not going to work, Cindy. Don't worry about it. Oh, it's working. <laughs> Call me down. All right. So can you see that? There he comes. Can you play it? She is a miracle worker. All right. So there you see, and there, right there, he reaches in his pocket and he comes back around. His wife is out of the picture. Again, she's stabbed with a pocket knife. All right, it's playing over and over again now. She can just stop it so we can go uh, to the next one. Now, before I really go much further, I want y'all to think about what you just saw. Fred Shuttlesworth was a man of faith, a preacher. He, he, I can go to the next one, or can I? Oh, that's just me. Fred Shuttlesworth was a preacher, a man of faith. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I knew Fred. I actually was the, uh, the, the lawyer that did his will after he passed away. One of the most incredible human beings I've ever met and truly believed his presence on earth was for a reason uh, higher than just preaching the gospel. And that's what happened to a preacher simply to try to get his children a better education meeting with a mob of white vigilantes and beaten and kicked that. And that would have could have happened in any number of places. But now you see with Bobby Cherry, the first piece of the puzzle that we have for our trial comes into play. Now I'm not doing it, Cindy, it's not moving. Uh, this. Okay, this is all me. This is all my fault. I'm going to move this out so I can do this. All right. Now, you fast forward a little bit from 1957. Lots going on in Birmingham, Alabama. The civil rights movement is moving. But we didn't really have a lot of evidence about Cherry or Blant being involved uh, anything until 1963. But what happened in the intervening periods was incredibly important. For instance, in 1960, Freedom Riders come through Birmingham. You know all about the Freedom Riders, John Lewis and others who got on a bus in Washington, D.C., traveled down the, throughout the South to try to enforce the Civil Rights uh, Law of 1957 to integrate interstate uh, transportation facilities that had not been integrated. Outside of Birmingham in a city called Anniston, their bus was firebombed. Uh, people almost died, but for the fact that the state troopers started firing up in the air to the crowd to get them dispersed because the Klan was holding the door of the bus to try to keep people inside that bus. But they persisted. They came to Birmingham. 
And in Birmingham at the time was controlled by this man, Bull Connor. He was the one of three commissioners, and he was stopping everything. He was one of the most bigoted human beings ever to live. And he was going to enforce the Jim Crow laws. And so that day when they rolled into Birmingham, we now know that Connor had made a plan with a Klan, uh, Ku Klux Klan to keep his police officers away for about 20 minutes. It was Mother's Day of 1961. And the Freedom Riders rolled into the trailways or Greyhound bus station and there was nobody there but Klansmen. And this is what was the result. When asked about it, when asked why his, his police officer weren't there to protect these people, he just said, you know, Connor just simply said it was Mother's Day and they were visiting their mamas. True story. But these Klansmen weren't real smart either. And this is this is this is this photograph was taken by a Birmingham Post Herald photographer who had his camera broken uh, by the Klan. They saw, they got it, they grabbed it, they smashed, and they threw it in the trash can. But what they didn't do is they didn't expose the film. So he just went over and picked it up out of the trash, took it back, and this picture and others went across the world. And by the way, the really large butt that you see in the very front is a guy named Gary Thomas Rowe, who was actually an FBI informant at the time. He was, he later, was in the car in Selma that, uh, where the shots were fired that killed Viola Luzo during the Selma to Montgomery march. They tried him a little bit later. He was, well, they never really tried him. They tried to sue him, but he was working literally as an FBI informant uh, at the time. But when this picture was flashed around the world, people really started to question Birmingham in a big, big way. There was a group of business leaders in, in Tokyo, Japan, at a, a Rotary or a Kiwanis Club, and they saw all of the reaction of their colleagues about Birmingham when they saw this beating of the Freedom Riders, and they knew that something had to change. These guys were no friends of the Civil Rights Movement, but they knew something had to change, and they came back to Birmingham to change the form of government. They got some young lawyers, David Van, Chuck Morgan, to try to work to, and get a referendum to change this, the form of government. And they were successful. In 1962, the people of Birmingham voted to change the form of government and go uh, do away with a three-member commission and get a mayor and city council. And elections were set <clears throat> for February of 1963. At the same time all that was going on, Reverend Shuttlesworth was in Atlanta talking to Dr. King to tell him to move, to come to Birmingham, to desegregate the city that Dr. King had called the most segregated city in America. And it was. The only problem was if they came in the springtime during this election, the odds would be that Bull Connor would be elected. He was running for the mayor's seat. And they didn't want that to happen. <clears throat> so they postponed coming to Birmingham. Then Connor gets in a runoff. They postpone it again. Fortunately, Connor loses to Albert Balpel. And as soon as that mayor's race was over, <clears throat> the movement came to the streets of Birmingham. Now, Connor didn't go quietly. There was actually lawsuits that went on for several months in which Birmingham had two governments, the old one and the new one, and they would both meet. And it was just a stalemate. But at the same time, while Connor was still in office, he had a, um, they came to Birmingham and it was the children, thank you. It was the children of Birmingham who took to the streets. Y'all have seen all of these pictures probably at some time. But the adults in Birmingham couldn't afford to leave their jobs to go march in the streets of Birmingham. They would lose those jobs. It didn't matter if it was in the factories or the foundries or domestic help in the, what we called the over the mountain, more affluent neighborhoods. They would lose those jobs. So it was the children. The schools would empty out every day. They would listen to the radio for disc jockeys like Tall Paul White and Shelley the Playboy Stewart that would give them the signals of when to meet. And most of the time, they would meet at the church, at 16th Street Baptist Church to plan in the sanctuary, the peaceful demonstrations. I got asked the other day when I was in at Texas Tech about um, 
violence and that the civil rights movement was successful because of confrontation and violence. And I said, wait a minute, you've got your history wrong. Dr. King preached peace and nonviolence. And that's what was going to happen in Birmingham, Alabama. They would literally meet in the sanctuary of a church to plan a demonstration, to walk out just like they're doing now, walk across the street and walk about five blocks to City Hall for voting rights, for civil rights. But they no sooner got into that intersection than Bull Connor met them with fire hoses and dogs. And you've seen, I'm sure, photographs. This is literally across the street from the church. This one is from Kelly Ingram Park. You can see the church in the background. And that's why I show a lot of these pictures because it's not like they marched to Selma. It was literally, you know, 50 to 100 feet before they got into the park or into the street, before the hoses and the dogs. And this is the most famous picture that hit the news st uh, stands. It is the picture that President Kennedy said made him physically ill and prompted him to really start working on a Civil Rights Act. Bull Connor had a, a tank, a water tank, that patrolled to kind of keep people in, in check during this time. I guarantee you that that tank never saw the streets of the white neighborhoods in Birmingham. It was there for a reason, and Bull Connor used it here. They also made the arrest, thousands of kids, junior high, high school, college kids, all youth. That's why the, all of this was called the Children's Crusade. It started out with the name Project C, Project Confrontation, but quickly became the Children's Crusade. And these kids went to, to jail. They had so many that the Birmingham City Jail filled up. They had to put them at, a, at Fair Park, which is where the State Fair met. The whole time Dr. King was meeting secretly with his comrades, but also with Birmingham business leaders. Those same business leaders who came back to form a new government had seen that enough. They weren't, as I said, friends of the movement, but they knew that their city was going to dry up and their businesses were going to die. And so they met secretly with Dr. King and Reverend Abernathy and Reverend Shuttlesworth to forge a settlement, a really modest settlement in the, in the um, marches. This settlement would do things that should have been done under the law years ago. It, it took down white and colored signs in the restrooms and water uh, coolers in the downtown department stores. It did away with Jim Crow laws that made it a crime punishable by going to jail for a black man and a white man to be caught playing checkers together in public. Birmingham got rid of those laws. It did not go as far as requiring the Birmingham police to hire black police officers. That didn't ha happen for some time later. But even with this very modest settlement, and people often forget Birmingham was one of the first cities because of this to do away with their Jim Crow laws. But even with this very modest settlement, the Klan was not happy. They were seeing their segregated way of life sliding away. And they just weren't happy. That night after this settlement was announced, Robert Shelton, the imperial wizard, grand dragon, super duper poopah person with the Klan. Yeah, I mean, these guys had titles as big as their egos. Um, he announced the United Clans of America was one of the largest, if not the largest, Klan organization in the country. It was based in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And Shelton was the, the leader. And he announced on TV that that settlement, that very modest settlement would be Dr. King's epitaph. And sure enough, a bomb exploded at the A.G. Gaston Motel right on the other side of the church where Dr. King had been staying. But fortunately, he had left to go back to Atlanta and no one was injured. But the die was cast. Klan was not happy. And the die was cast for a couple of things that we, we made sure we emphasized in our trial. Number one, the Klan wasn't, was not happy. But now there are two targets, two targets of the Klan's wrath. Number one, the church. The church became a symbol of the movement because that's where everybody was. And second, it was the youth of Birmingham that became a target. When you became the symbols of the movement, 
you had a target on your chest and your back. And now the youth and that church were both symbols. And so a couple more pieces of the puzzle for our trial fall into place. After that settlement was announced, there were more bombings in Birmingham. This is the home of Reverend A.D. King, the brother of Martin Luther King, who was preaching in Birmingham. His home was bombed in February. No, I'm sorry, it was in May, after the, just two weeks after the marches were over. In early June, George Wallace stands in the schoolhouse door, watch two kids, Vivian Malone and James Hood, from entering the University of Alabama. Now, history will tell you this was all a staged show. Wallace promised to do it. He said he would do it. It was a campaign promise. He did it, but he stepped aside. He was never going to stop the Justice Department from enrolling those kids. That Nicholas Katzenbach with his arms crossed. Uh, he was the deputy attorney general at the time, later became attorney general. Macon Weaver is the man on the right. He was the United States attorney. He was never going to stop them from enrolling, but the Klan didn't know that. They were, they were circling around Tuscaloosa, armed to the teeth, waiting for the race war to start. But Wallace stepped aside, and with that, the Klan was unhappy again. <clears throat> A couple of pieces of interesting uh, trivia. The woman that Wallace stopped, Vivian Malone, uh, was from Mobile, Alabama. Uh, she later became the first African-American student to graduate from Alabama, went on to an incredible life. Her sister is married to Eric Holder, the first African-American attorney general. Uh, his sister, Sharon Malone Holder, uh, I'm friends with both of those. And they came back a lot during the 50th anniversary. And the connection with the Holder family is pretty strong, as you can see. And I often tell people that Alabama tends to glorify resistance way too much, like the Confederacy. And I wish we could figure out how to get our history books to stop calling this the stand in the schoolhouse door and start calling it the walk through the schoolhouse door because it was the bravery of those kids that we ought to remember, not George Wallace's defiant stand. But the Klan was unhappy when he stepped aside. Their hero let him down. And so that summer, there were more bombings in Birmingham. Birmingham had seen its share, 40 or 50 over 20 years. But that summer, they, they, they stepped up the violence. It's the only way the Klan knew how to react. Arthur Shores, who was one of the prominent black attorneys, later the, one of the first uh, members of the Birmingham City Council, his home was bombed twice. This is a photograph of the second bomb. B Birmingham was beginning to really kind of turn a lot. And in August, we saw the I Have a Dream speech. 250, 300,000 people on the mall of Washington, D.C., and hope is in the air. It's filled with everybody as this movement was gaining so much momentum. But in Birmingham, it was a different story. In Birmingham, about this same time, the federal courts had ordered Birmingham City Schools to be desegregated for the first time. See, after Fred Shuttlesworth <clears throat> was beaten up, he got some folks and they filed a lawsuit. 1957, it took six years for that lawsuit to go up and down the old Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. And in August of 1963, the federal courts ordered the Birmingham schools to be desegregated for the first time. And remember what I was talking about, about <clears throat> Brown versus Board and all the violence that occurred with school integration? You see how we connect the dots for this trial because it was school desegregation that was causing Birmingham to literally be like a cauldron. And this was what was going on outside of all of the white schools in Birmingham. Boycotts from the white students, Confederate battle flags flying everywhere. And I've told folks for 20 years, long before Charleston and Confederate flags started coming down, that if you don't understand that that battle flag is a symbol of hate and not a symbol of history, look at this picture. 
in the trial, we had a couple of things. I did. I found this a, a couple three years ago. I didn't even notice it at the time, and I was going through with a writer that helped me on the book, and we were looking through all of the stuff. And I, I came. I put, showed him these newspapers that we had from the time. They were called the Thunderbolt, which is the state's rights rag, a racist rag that they would publish every week or month. And on the back of that newspaper, there was an advertisement where you could buy your Confederate battle flag. This is from 1964. You could buy that Confederate battle flag from the state's rights party. And it said on there that the Confederate battle flag is no longer a sectional emblem, but an emblem of the white race and white supremacy. That was 1964. I wish I had that paper here with me to show you what I'm talking about. And as lawyers like to say, I rest my case about the damn Confederate battle flag. That's what was going on outside the city of Birmingham on all the schools and all the protests. But on September the 10th, 1963, five days before this bombing, the Birmingham city schools are integrated. That's Dwight and Floyd Armstrong walking into Raymond Elementary School. The children of Birmingham were once again the focal point of the movement. You can imagine the hate that these young men had. That's their father, um, Mr. Armstrong, with a file right behind him, Reverend Shuttlesworth leading the parade. Man with a hat on the left is Oscar Adams. Oscar, one of, another one of our great lawyers. Oscar Adams later became the first African American to sit on the Alabama Supreme Court. He was appointed and then won a statewide election. I think the only African-American to win a statewide election uh, in Alabama. And this is a photograph of Mr. Armstrong testifying at the Cherry Trial. Mr. Armstrong carried the flag in the Selma to Montgomery March. Five days before this bombing. And so on Sunday, 19, September 15th, 1963, the marquee outside the church advertise the youth worship service. The youth of Birmingham and that church were coming together again. And that made them a double target. And that morning, some of the participants gathered in the ladies' lounge in the basement. This is Addie Mae Collins. Addie was 14 years old. It's an older picture of Addie Mae. Had come to Sunday school and church with her, her sisters uh, that morning several of them. She went down in the ladies' lounge along with Cynthia Morris Wesley. Cynthia is, I think, a really interesting story because uh, Cynthia, Cynthia was living in the Wesley family. Her had a big family. Her dad had abandoned the family, and the kids were truant, and Cynthia um, was a very smart and a social worker, saw something and convinced her mom to let her live with the Wesleys who were all teachers, both teachers. And they brought her in. And there's a story that goes that after Cynthia's death, the Wesleys brought another little girl, 14 years old, same age after Cynthia's death. And I, I don't, this is the term that was told. It was like Cynthia's replacement after she died. And that young lady never met Cynthia, but she came to our trials. She's come to the church and helped raise money. The last I talked to her, she was a very prominent, successful psychologist in Texas. And you look at her or the replacement, or you look at Katanji Brown Jackson and you see the possibilities that we lose when children die. And that is a really special moment for me last Friday to think about these kids and to see Judge Jackson behind that presidential podium. And Cynthia was there along with Denise McNair. Denise was the youngest. This is a photograph that Denise's father, Chris, took. He was a photographer and this was his favorite. There's a documentary that Spike Lee did called Four Little Girls. If you ever get a chance to watch it, it's really well done. And he kind of followed the McNair family more and he, Chris said this was his favorite picture of Denise. And so I had been friends with the McNair family a long time. And so I used it um, because it was a father's favorite picture of his child. 
not knowing that there's some special meaning later on. And then Carol Robertson, this is the daughter of Alpha Robertson. She was a dancer. And these four young ladies gathered down in the lounge to get ready for the worship service. And about 1022 officially, this clock says about 1024, but this is a clock across the street at Denise McNair's grandfather's establishment of dry goods. Time always stands still when things like this happen. It stood still for Birmingham for many, many years. It stood still for Alabama and this country for a long time. But it was about 1024 that the bomb blew up. Reverend John Cross was the minister. He was in the choir off. The, that's where so many of the, the adults were meeting. Their Sunday school classes were meeting in the sanctuary. And he came down and, and, and walked outside and went in and so on. And Reverend John Cross identified these photographs of the day. He had always lived with the guilt of these girls' deaths. So he testified in both trials and this was a really powerful bomb. You could see that the, the, what was left of the steps, the opening on the far right is the door that the steps led to and the steps went straight across that really large window where those men are standing. That was the window that went into the ladies lounge where these uh, girls were. You can see across the street all the windows of the buildings that were blown out. This was a pretty powerful blast. Um, we don't know for sure. We believe it was 14 or 15 sticks of dynamite. Dynamite was plentiful, but we couldn't find it. We don't, we know they could not determine what the blast was. This is the windows just above where the blast occurred. And there was also a stained glass window. And this is the most famous picture from this horrific incident. Picture of Jesus as the good shepherd. And you will notice that in this particular stained glass window, the most significant of damage is to the face of Christ. And his, that church always has used this to say it was as if Jesus could not believe, could not see what his children had done to his children. This picture that's still in the basement of the church, when they, people see it, they still get emotional about how this could happen in a house of worship. As I said, inside the sanctuary, the adult Sunday school classes were meeting. There were about 25, 26 people that were injured, you know, glass flying through, no significant injuries, uh, fortunately, but you can see how the glass blew out the windows. And this is right above. And then these automobiles that were right outside the, um, on the sidewalk got blown away from the uh, a sidewalk. All of the windows, again, across the street at the Ruman House, destroyed. This car completely destroyed by the force of the blast. You can see how the uh, bricks and mortar flew into the cars on the outside. There's concrete steps completely obliterated. It blew through 18 inches of concrete. Foundation of this church. And the most significant blast was right into the ladies' lounge where these young girls were. It destroyed the walls. It exposed the steps leading up to the back of the sanctuary. And this is a look into the room. And the sink that you see becomes part of our story. Complete devastation inside the ladies' lounge. As I said a little earlier, it took a long time for the FBI to do something. They did a remarkable job, but you just can't solve every homicide, and they couldn't solve it then. And it took a new attorney general getting elected in 1970 to really get this investigation jump-started. Bill Baxley was 28 years old when he was elected as Alabama's attorney general, youngest in the country, probably one of the youngest that's ever been in, in this country. And he had been a law student at the time when the blast occurred and made it a point of saying if he ever had the chance, he was going to do something about this case. And he got his chance. He was a DA. And as soon as he got elected attorney general, this was in 1970, he gets elected. We didn't have internet phones and things like this. And I'm already running behind, Lissy. Sorry. But they gave him a card that anywhere in the state of Alabama, he could go to a phone and dial a local number and get the state switchboard to make long distance calls or whatever. He gave them that card, it had 10 numbers on it. 
He could just use that local. And because he was elected attorney general with the idea of doing something about this, he wrote the name of each of those girls in each of the four corners of that card. And so that he could always remember why he ran and got elected whenever he used that card. He was able to find that. It's now the Civil Rights Institute. But Bill worked very diligently. He had a great team. And this is the man I was talking about, Bob Chambliss, affectionately known as Dynamite Bob. Chambliss was part of a, of a group, a splinter group of Klansmen that would meet outside the regular Clavern meetings. We had a lot of Claverns, which were chapters of the Klan that met in Alabama. And he would had a group that would meet separately. And part of that group was Tommy Blanton who I would later prosecute. This is a photograph of Blanton after he was um, interviewed by the FBI in October of 1963. It's a photograph of Blanton about a month before his trial. And Ch Bobby Cherry, who you saw in the video, uh, was a part of this group. Cherry was a truck driver. This is a picture of Cherry uh, at his trial in 2002. They would meet just outside of Birmingham underneath this bridge the Cahaba River Bridge. They literally meet like a bunch of little trolls that used to scare the hell out of you when you were kids. And that's where this bomb was hatched. And that is another piece of the puzzle. There was a lot of activity at, the, uh, uh, at, at a place called the Modern Sign Shop and at the bridge the weekend before and the weekend of the bombing. Two other pieces that come into play uh, in our trial at some point. The modern sign shop was about three or four blocks from the church, and it's where the owner allowed the Klan to come and make their anti-civil rights signs. And we had evidence of a lot of activity there and a lot of activity at the church. We finally got indictments on these guys in May of 2000. Yeah, May of 2000. We're going to try them together, as I said, but we had an issue. We went to trial separately. The first one we tried was Blanton. And on day one, all of the families were there. They were amazing. This is a picture. You see Miss Robertson and her daughter. You miss the McNairs are in the middle. The Collins sisters on the side. And they were, they were there every day. And one of the first witnesses we called was Junie Collins, Annie Mae's sister. Junie was counting the money for the Sunday school across the way when the bomb exploded. She had come to church that morning with Addie Mae and her sisters, and they'd gotten in a little fight over a ring. And she never got to see her again. And, and, and she had a lot of trouble with that. She had um, emotional issues that she dealt with all her life. Because the next time she saw him, she had to go. She's the one that had to identify Addie Mae's body at the morgue that afternoon. And we, in those days, we didn't do for victims what we do now. And so she's had a, a difficult time. Eunice Davis was Cynthia's sister. They were living apart. Remember, Cynthia was living in, with the Wesleys. And she found out about it, heard about her sister's death on the radio and had to go, it got her mom, and they went to the Wesley family to find out everything and what, it, what all had happened. Eunice, was a, this is a great story, too. She, we had not reached out to her. And, and I had really meticulously... minutes I put her on the witness stand just hoping for the best and she was absolutely amazing then there was Maxine McNair Maxine the mother of Denise she and Denise went to 16th street that day stopped at the steps and Denise goes down and Maxine goes to the choir law for her Sunday school class was meeting Maxine just passed away about two months ago it was a great friend but she's in the choir loft, and that bomb explodes right below her. And I asked her, Miss McNair, what, what did it, was it? What, tell me what happened. She said, the explosion, we didn't know if it was a bomb. We didn't know if a plane had crashed into the building. So what, what was the reaction in there? She said, there was debris flying everywhere and soot, and, and people were screaming and hollering. I said, what about you? She said, I just screamed, my baby, my baby, because she knew that the niece was just in that lady's lounge just below her. Her husband, Chris, was a Lutheran, went to a different church, heard about it, and had to go to the church only to be told that he needed to go straight to the makeshift morgue that they had made for these four girls. And he walked in and he identified his only daughter at the time with a piece of mortar embedded in her skull. 
Chris was a photographer, had a photographic studio. It was amazing pictures. And he had a, a room that was a memorial to Denise with her shoes and her dress and some drawings, and other things. And he had that piece of mortar. And Chris was a great friend. I've known him since I was in college. And I went and visited him several times and I kept seeing it. And I finally got up the nerve to ask him, Chris, why do you keep that? I said, you know, I understand the memorial, but that just seems a, a little bit, you know, too much. He said, Doug, let me tell you something. People come and see this all the time and they mourn for those girls and they learn the history and they, 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 they are just despondent over what happened. But until they see that piece of mortar, they really don't fully appreciate what people can do in the name of hate. And I never questioned them again. And I made sure that both my juries not only saw, but held that piece of mortar. I never questioned him again. These families, folks, were just amazing. They waited patiently for the wheels of justice to turn, and it took a long time. Unlike Cherry and Blanton and their like, they were completely as far opposite of the kind of human beings as possible. This is a photograph of Cherry. In 1997, FBI goes out to interview Cherry in Texas. He, they thought he had almost confessed in the 70s to Baxley, and they think, well, maybe... Maybe this time, maybe this time he'll come through. He's older. Maybe he'll have some epiphany. No, no epiphany for chair. These people, these, these old Klansmen aren't even, I don't even think they have warm blood in them. None at all. But Cherry was the kind of guy that could never tell you the truth. He would always lie. Everything. And those lies caught up to him at some point with all of this. But most importantly, what happened is that he called a press conference after he was interviewed by the FBI. He called a press conference to denounce the U.S. attorney and the FBI and said they'd been hounding him for years, you know, since the 1963. This was in, the, this was in 1997. They'd been hounding him for 30-something years. He was innocent. He, never, he was a member of the Klan, but he was not violent. And let me tell you, folks, when that occurred when they were shown in Texas, he was living in Maybank, Texas, in Texas and in Birmingham, the phone started ringing. And one of the first people that called was this young lady, Teresa Stacy, his granddaughter. First thing out of her mouth to the dispatch was, thank God somebody's looking at this, at this case. Everybody knows my grandfather was involved. He would brag about it at Sunday dinners. And he talked about it, and, he, and she went on to testify how he would constantly brag about the terrorist acts that they uh, occurred with black people in Birmingham, and how he would brag about blowing up the church and killing those little girls. She was the only family member to come forward. She was estranged from the family. That's Mickey Johnson, the defense lawyer, who was questioning her. But she was incredibly brave and, wore, and, and, and did an unbelievable job as a witness. And the thing, the pieces of the puzzle started coming into play. And, and she wasn't the only one that caught him. I'll show you a minute ago. But I will tell you a quick piece of advice for those of you who ever get the chance to represent people accused of a crime. Don't let them talk to the media. Don't let them talk to the media. Nothing can come good of that because it was the media that picked up all of this and that she saw it. And not only her, Willa Dean Brogdon. Willa Dean was Cherry's third wife, three out of five for Bobby Frank Cherry. These guys were abusers too, by the way. She saw it. Now, when I became U.S. attorney, my agents told me about a, a woman that Cherry married named Willa Dean, but they couldn't find her. This was in you know, 1997. They had been looking for a long time and they couldn't find her. They knew they got married in the 70s. They knew they had a record of divorce, but they couldn't find her. I said, what do you mean you can't find her? You're the FBI, for God's sakes. <laughs> they said, I'm sorry, we can't. Let me tell you what happened. Reporter came over, did a story about this from Mississippi, Jerry Mitchell. He's got a book out about some of these things. It hit the wire services, and that story appeared in her hometown newspaper in Glendive, Montana. And she had thought Bob Cherry had gone to prison for this already. 
And when she saw that story, she called the FBI and said, I know something about this. Let me come talk to you. She drove 200 miles to tell the story of Bobby Frank Cherry. My agents were, Birmingham were so excited, I think they beat her there. It's 2,000 miles away. But she talked about how she had gotten married to this guy. He used to prance around and, and scare the kids wearing his Klan robes. That one time, the car broke down. His car broke down, and she went to pick him up, and it was right near the church, and he pointed over to the steps. He said, that's where we planted the bomb. And he would talk about it in his sleep and different things, and he would say people weren't supposed to get hurt, but then on the same breath, he would brag about killing those little girls. And in, 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 in what I think is just unbelievable testimony, she would say he would talk. On the one hand, he would say nobody was supposed to hurt. And in the very next breath, say, well, but at least they can't breed. That's the kind of people that we were dealing with here, folks. And she introduced us to her brother. And her brother gave the same kind of testimony about Cherry's admissions. And there was another individual named uh, Bobby Birdwell, who I don't have a photograph of. He was a kid, friends with... Cherry's oldest son, and they were playing at the Cherry household the weekend of the bombing, and he testified he saw the three men sitting around the kitchen table, and they were talking about the bomb, and the bomb being ready, and they sped specifically about 16th Street Baptist Church, and my colleague asked him, why didn't you come forward earlier? He said, man, I was a white kid in a Klansman's house. I was scared to death. And my parents wouldn't have understood. They wouldn't have wanted me to anyway. But he saw it on the news. And he came forward, as did this man, Michael Goins. <clears throat> Michael Goins was from Birmingham, but had moved to Texas and was living in Dallas in 1980, cleaning apartments that his mom managed. And Cherry had moved to Dallas and had a carpet cleaning business. And they're there one day cleaning apartments and in a conversation that I think is so relevant to today's political climate, the talk is complaining about the rise of the Hispanic population in Dallas. And what does Cherry do? He talks about how they terrorize the black community in Birmingham and says we need to take care of the Mexicans the same way we took care of black folks. And you can imagine the racial slurs that he used with that. Everything seems to come around sometimes, guys. Always remember that. You can't always stop history from repeating itself. You can only try. But they all came forward. And that was, the, the, the Cherry case was based in large measure on his admissions. And it was a far cry from the Blanton case because in the Blanton case, this man with a megaphone, James Lay, uh, was a civil defense kind of guy. He was a postal worker and he would leave his job and then go right around with others to try to protect the homes of the civil rights leaders. And two weeks before the bombing, he's driving by the church and he sees a car parked on the side at one o'clock in the morning. And there's two white men standing there. That's pretty unusual. Two white men standing at the church, one by the car, one standing by those steps, holding what he called a grip. It would have been a backpack type thing, a, you know, a, some kind of gym bag, maybe. And he hit his bright lights and they take off. And he and a friend go looking around. They don't see anything. They call the Birmingham police and say, you know, um, told them what they saw. And the Bur Birmingham police just say, well, you're going home, boy. You didn't see a damn thing. Boy was the name given to all black men by the Birmingham police at the time, regardless of their age. It's going home, boy. You didn't see a damn thing. Two weeks later, he's not far from the church, and he tells the FBI what he saw, and they bring him up, and they confirm it with the police, who didn't make a report, but they confirmed it, what had happened, and, he sh and they were shown about 100 pictures, not in a lineup or anything like that, but 100 pictures of Klansmen. And sure enough, he picked out two people that he said he was pretty sure, not 100%, eyewitness testimony rarely is, but he would testify. Two witnesses, the two people saw the guy standing by the, the car, Robert Chambliss, and the guy holding the grip by the steps, Tommy Blanton. Pretty strong circumstantial evidence, guys, if you've had your evidence classes. Pretty strong for a prosecutor. And we knew that Blanton, with another witness, was a suspect because his car had been seen at 2 o'clock in the morning. 
This is his 1957 Chevy. You can't really see it well, but it's got about an eight-foot-tall uh, whip antenna on the back, his CB antenna. And his car was seen at about 2 o'clock in the morning by this lady, Mrs. Glenn, Gertha's Glenn. She was visiting from Detroit at the time. And she was trying to park her car, and she saw that car with its light on, the dome light inside, and there were three white men there. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. And she saw the three people there, and she identified Robert Chambliss as one of them. She didn't know the others, but she identified Chambliss. And she testified. This is a photograph of her in the Cherry trial uh, testifying. So we knew that he was a suspect. Unfortunately, Ms. Glenn had passed away in the 1980s, and I couldn't use her testimony, but I was able to get out the time that the car was seen at two o'clock in the morning because the time was really important because of what Blanton said and did. And I'll tell you about that in a second, but I want to talk about Mitch Burns. Mitch Burns was an informant. Because Blanton was a suspect, they got an informant. Mitch was a Klansman, but they enlisted him to act as an informant with Tommy Blanton. And they got introduced, and for two years, Mitch Burns rides around with Tommy Blanton. And at that point, every time they would get together, Blanton would say, well, Mitch, let's go out in your car because you know the FBI's got mine bugged. Well, the FBI put bugs everywhere. It was true. They were in the homes. They were on phones. And what they didn't know was that they had actually put a bug in Mitch's car with his permission. And they caught on tape a lot of conversations. We didn't get a smoking gun with, with, with Blanton. We played about 26 excerpts of tape recordings of Mitch Burns and Tommy Blanton talking. And Blanton would laugh and, and, and say what he would do the next time he bombed a church. They would always ride by the church. There was one time <clears throat> that the, they couldn't turn the um, microphone on on the recorder because he didn't get permission. The supervisor wasn't available. But Mitch remembered a conversation. He went to pick up Cherry. And as they were turning into an alley behind Cherry's house, Tommy Blanton says, this is the alley I almost missed the night we bombed the church. And Mitch tried to keep him talking. And inside, Cherry started laughing and said, yeah, you know, they, they think they know where the church, uh, where the bomb was made, but we got him way off base. He bra bragged and bragged. We do have him on tape bragging about how he lied to the FBI in all his interviews. And finally, Blanton interrupts him and says, Bob, you shouldn't talk too much around this old boy, meaning Mitch. He don't know too much, and we need to keep it that way. Mitch was an amazing witness, had a really great memory for everything that went on. And we played those 26 excerpts. But the real kicker for Tommy Blanton was because of this man, Mr. Colvin. He was a, they called him Slim. He was not an agent, but a technician in their electronic surveillance. And he went undercover as a truck driver and went into the house where Tommy Blanton had married his girlfriend. Because hearkening back to Mrs. Glenn, Tommy Blanton had, the night before the bombing, gone out with his girlfriend, Jean. She had called on Friday night to break the Friday night date, and she told him, never come back if you don't take me out this weekend. So they went out on Saturday. We knew that that had happened. And we had evidence that, they, that Cherry and others were at the sign shop on Friday where Blanton said he was. And on Saturday night, though, when Blanton was interviewed, that picture I showed you, when he was interviewed, he couldn't remember what all they did. He couldn't remember where they went. He knew he picked her up by 6. They went and got us a bite to eat, but couldn't remember where they were. And he had her home by 12 because she was only 17. That was her curfew. He said, I took her home and I went to bed. Now, this is two weeks later. And Agent Frank Spencer, who had interviewed uh, Blanton, said, well, that's funny, Tommy because we've got a witness that has your car behind the church at two o'clock in the morning, which is plenty of time for you to go pick up your buddies and plant that bomb. And he clams up and he calls his girlfriend, Jean. And lo and behold, they get their stories together. Now they have a minute by minute blow of where they were. He picked her up. They went to Ed Salem's drive-in. They went up to Vulcan, which was a famous parking place. They went parking for a while and he did have her home by midnight, but guess what? Now they all both remember he fell asleep at 2 o'clock uh, and didn't wake up till about 2.45.
and then's when he went home. And Gene, Jean was his alibi for almost 40 years. She stood by her man, despite the fact, as Tammy Wynette would say, she stood by her man for so many years, even though they got divorced every time this case wrapped up, they got remarried when it got ramped up again. But she stuck to that story until we found a tape recording that John Colvin had planted with a bug. And that's what I want to play for you right now, if I can. And I've got a transcript. Three times, three times out of his own mouth, making the bomb, planting the bomb. Folks, this, 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 this tape had been made in a special way. We never thought we could use it. And we really worked and got it into evidence because of some really good lawyer and then not me did, but somebody else who's smarter than I did was able to convince this, this judge to get in the tape. But three times, tape had been sitting in a paper sack or a box for almost 40 years and hadn't been heard since that time. And my agent was just not going to say no and found it. And, and we, we knew about Gene and we knew all the things. And all of a sudden now, Gene, his alibi testify, says right there that she lied to the FBI. So she's not going to testify and doesn't come to, I got to tell you, I played this tape so many times during the preparation of that trial. I played it so many times for her, trying to get her to, to talk to me. I am, I am truly afraid that when I start to leave this life and this earth, and that bright light like that one gets brighter, I'm gonna hear this voice in the distance going, well, Tommy, <laughs> and I will go the other way, no matter where it comes from. But it was, it, it, I'm, I'm telling you, we couldn't crack her. She stayed true. But because of that, she couldn't testify about the alibi, wouldn't. And we finally broke it. Can you get it back for me? Yes. Give me a second. So I'm going to wind this up. I'm, I'm, I'm later. I always run late, and I apologize. When I first became, when I became the U.S. attorney, my staff didn't know my history with this case. I knew all of them but they didn't know my, my history with the case. And I told them that we had to get this thing done. They said, don't get your hopes up, Doug. It's an old case. People are dead. People are dying. So if we don't do it now, it'll never get done. I didn't realize how prophetic that really was. About two months before the bombing, James Lay has, I mean, before the trial, James Lay has a stroke and he's incapacitated. His mind's still good, but he can't talk, can hardly move. I went to visit him. He still wants to testify. And so I worked out with his doctors. We're going to bring him in an ambulance and bring him up 
and, and have him get on the stand or sit in a wheelchair in front of the stand and put him under oath and get him denied. And I knew that the rules of evidence would let me talk to him and get, read him his questions and answers and just ask him if it was true. He was a witness at the grand jury and an amazing witness, very soft-spoken. And I really wanted the jury to see him and to see his bravery, even though they couldn't hear him. And I was going to do that. And then right before, as we got into the trial, two days into the trial, I get a call from my agent. He comes and tells me that Mr. Spencer, Agent Spencer, who had interviewed Blanton, who Blanton had lied to, also a really important part of our case, had, was being driven up from Tampa, Florida, by his daughter, and they think he had heart failure in Montgomery, which is 90 miles south of Birmingham. He's in intensive care. Mr. Lay's in a nursing home. Now my other star witness is in intensive care. If That's a challenge for a trial lawyer. Mr. Spencer got okay. He came up. He testified. He was amazing. Oldest FBI agent to ever testify in a trial, but I got worried about, I got really worried about Mr. Lay and so I cut a deal with the defense, and we just read his testimony. I didn't bring him, and I let them do some things on cross. You can do that when you trust lawyers. You can do that when you trust the other side and you have some confidence in your case. I let him do some things that he couldn't have done, so I didn't get out the testimony. I didn't get the jury to see Mr. Lay, but they got the testimony. As it turns out, a month after the Blanton case, he was only going to be a a witness in Blanton's case, a month after the Blanton case, I pick up the newspaper and I see where Mr. Lay had died. We would have lost that testimony forever. And he wasn't the only one. A, year, a month after the Cherry case was completed a year later, John Colvin goes back into the hospital with cancer and dies. About the same time, I get a, a, um, a call from Miss Robertson. We're supposed to go, to go to New York together. She's going to receive an award posthumously for the girls from the Congress of Racial Equality. She calls to tell me she couldn't go. Her test had come back and she was in the hospital. I go by and see her. And on a sunny day in August, when I've given this speech in New York City, she passes away. She was an amazing woman. I think about her all the time. I think about her all the time. And when I went to her memorial service, her son who just, he didn't, he was different. He didn't come to the trials. He came running up to me afterwards. He said, Doug, thank you for coming. But more importantly, thank you for what you did. It was because of you. She died with a smile on her face. You just don't get any better, lawyers. Don't get any better than that. At Thanksgiving, Mitch Burns wakes up with chest pains two days before Thanksgiving and collapses on his warrior home and dies of a heart attack. Mitch lived and died a Klansman never violent and always ended up doing the right thing and never asking for anything about it. A year afterwards, it was Michael Goins. Not long after that, it was Reverend Cross. Reverend Shuttlesworth is gone. Eunice Davis is gone. All in a period of about two to three years after these trials. And it was not just the witnesses. A couple of years after the, his trial, Bobby Frank Cherry dies in an Alabama prison. And I have no regrets that he died in a prison. He should have been in prison many, many years ago. And I will finally leave you with this. I told you about the sink and the story. History often forgets that there were five little girls in that lady's lounge that morning. You hear about the four that died, but there was a fifth, and she walked over to the sink to wash her hands. Her name was Sarah Collins. Today, she's married at Sarah, Sarah Collins Rudolph. She still lives in Birmingham. She's Addie Mae's sister. She was down there with them that morning, and she walked over to, she was my last witness. She walked over to the sink, and she was washing her hands, and I said, Sarah, what happened? What occurred? She said, I heard my sister say something about her. Uh, I heard Denise McNair say something about her dress, and I looked into the room. What did you see? She said, I saw my sister, Addie Mae, tying the sash of Denise's new dress. Well, then what happened? Well, then there was the explosion. And I was buried beneath all the rubble and I couldn't see and I couldn't talk. I couldn't hardly breathe. So what did you do, Sarah? She said, I called out for help. I called out for my sister. She said, I just called out, Addie. 
Eddie, Eddie, her voice rising in the courtroom just like it did 37 years earlier. Did you ever hear her respond? No, sir. Did you ever see her alive again? No, sir. And with that, I looked up and said, Your Honor, the state of Alabama rest its case. It's a remarkable ending. It took about two hours for the jury to convict Blanton, about six to convict Cherry. And I got to tell you, folks, you can read and do a lot of things, but it all comes back to me, to this photograph. And I was, I was in my den trying to do my closing arguments. You know, lawyers get their inspiration from the weirdest things sometimes. I had a wall, like lawyers do with closing argument. I walk in and my daughter is watching the Shawshank Redemption. And remember that movie? At the end of the movie, Red is getting released and he's going to go find his friend who had escaped. And he finds a letter. And I walk in just as the letter was being read. And that letter was talking about hope. Never forget, Red, hope. Hope is a good thing. Maybe the best of things and good things never die. And that's what I told the jury the next day, that this picture, this photograph says it all. It's a photograph of the children who marched in the streets. It's a photograph of a, of a mother's heart that never stops crying for the death of a child. It's a photograph of the deaths of those four children and the injuries to Sarah. But most important, it's a, it's a photograph of hope. A young black girl holding her best friend, a white chatty Kathy doll. And in 1963, it was really the hope of the African-American community. But today, it's really the hope of us all that we can do a lot more for each other. We can love each other more. We can respect each other a hell of a lot more. We can understand that we are all part of this world. We're all part of this country together. And we've got to make sure that we do that. And that's the hope. That's the hope. And there are people out there today that are still trying to destroy that hope. People like Cherry and Blanton, they all live today and they're still trying to destroy the hope. But just remember, hope's a good thing. Maybe the best of things. And good things never die. For lawyers, I wish every lawyer could have a case that meant so much to so many people. I've spoken to so many lawyers and law students. The odds are you won't. But the odds are here somebody's going to be sitting, some, just like I sat out in law school and in college and every place else and watched all these things develop. Somebody here is going to have a chance to do something, something really special, something really good. You're getting prepared for it right now, but it will be up to you to take it. It will be up to you to seize that moment, to keep your moral compass and to keep your principles straight and, straight and true and to seize that moment for the betterment of your communities and not just for yourself. Seize it, folks. That's why you're here. That's why you're lawyers or going to be lawyers. That's what we do. So thank you for letting me share this story today. Thank you very much. We're running late. Anybody that needs to leave, please feel free. I, I tell people all the time, I'm, you know, married and I've raised three kids, so I'm used to people walking out on me while I, I talk. <laughs> but for those that want to stay and ask questions, I'm here for a while. We have microphones. I'm happy to stay for a while. Uh, if anybody has anything, questions, comments, outburst of emotion. Before we get to Professor Cassidy, does a student have a question? Yeah. No offense. <laughs> student, question. I never got any threats. That's always a question. Never got any threats. I got, I, I was more worried after the Eric Rudolph bombing in Birmingham than with these. Never got any threats at all. Uh, these guys were, they were not very, very good. Hey, Senator, uh, thank you for talking to us today. I just want to ask, what was, in your experience, in your time on this case, what was the most challenging part of the case in terms of the work uh, that you did. Obviously, there's a lot of very emotional things that you touched on, but in terms of your work on the case, what was the biggest challenge in, in retrospect? I, I, we were racing against time, number one. There were a number of witnesses who died 
that we thought could tell us. But really the most challenging thing was to try to crack the plan. There were, there were a lot of people that knew a lot about this case that never came forward. I mean, Mitch was an informant at the time. You notice I didn't have a single Klansman as, as one of these witnesses other than Mitch Burns. And he was an informant at the time. So the biggest challenge was doing that. We realized we weren't going to get that evidence. It was taking the evidence that we had and trying to put it together in a, in a, in a bigger, in a way that we could prove beyond a reasonable doubt they was, that they were guilty. So we were really, truly racing against time. I mean, all those people that died, I mean, none of those people, if we'd have waited a year, we'd have lost Mr. Lay. We'd have lost uh, John Colvin. Uh, Colvin authenticated the tape that you heard. I don't know if we could have gotten any of that in. You know, so it was truly a race against time, even though we we knew it, but we just didn't think about that that much. And and getting the tape into evidence was a the biggest legal challenge because we had to go through a whole series of things about the exclusionary rule and prove that it was the truth seeking was was more important than uh, that the truth seeking was more important than deterrence because it was really not going to deter the law had changed so dramatically that there would be no deterrent effect if the judge excluded that particular tape and the truth seeking really was the main thing. Senator, yeah. thank you so much. That was really riveting. Um, I'm just very confused about whether this case was prosecuted in state or federal court. You were a U.S. Yeah. attorney, but all of your exhibits say yep. states exhibit. Great so question. Could you uh, explain to people, did the attorney general ask you to serve as a special assistant yep. AG? Yeah, I, I, I'm a little rusty on this. I've done it a couple of 300 times, but not much since 2017 after I got elected. I'm just now getting to do them again. But that's exactly right. Um, we, we investigated the case in federal court. There was one statute that uh, 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 when a death occurs as a result of dynamite or explosives that had traveled interstate, it was no statute of limitations. The civil rights statutes then, even when a death, was a five-year statute. So it had been gone and we couldn't resurrect that. So when we couldn't make the jurisdictional element for federal court, we got the state attorney general to designate us as special uh, deputy assistant attorneys general. Um, the attorney general uh, was Bill Pryor, who is now the chief judge on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, he did that. In the second case, in Cherry case, I'd actually left the office and was in private practice. And Bill hired me and gave me a little bit of money to come back and and do it from private practice. And was there any sentiment by the state uh, authorities, the state AG, that they wanted their office to be involved because they felt like their state had to uh, vindicate its own interests? In no, not, not from the AG's office, but early on, before I became U.S. attorney, they had pulled our local district attorney in because they didn't know if they could make the federal aspect of this case. So the AG, uh, the state, uh, the deputy um, DA, local DA, they were involved in it from the beginning and had a, one of the prosecutors on the team was a state district attorney. Thank you. Good questions though. I, I, I forget, I forgot to say it. Yeah, we have one question on, from our virtual audience. Uh, Elizabeth, she asked. The voice of God coming through here. I didn't know where that was. <laughs> okay. I, Elizabeth asks, you mentioned that when this all happened, you were a white kid in Alabama focused on baseball and football. When and how did this case and story begin to resonate with you? Well, it, it resonated most of, most when I was in law school and I cut classes, but I started studying this in high school. My, my school was desegregated uh, and it was then integrated. My first opportunity was in junior high where the schools were integrated. So you learn about it and then in college, when I started really focusing on a lot of Alabama's history, but I think where it really hit home to me was um, in law school, because you know history just doesn't teach, wasn't teaching everything. So it was really in law school and learning more about it, and then then watching that trial and seeing the reaction uh, of the community. Um, and then a little bit related to that is. Um, Someone asked, do you think your race played a factor in your ability to get these witnesses to talk to you? You know, I don't think it did. Um, I, I, a lot of these folks came forward. The witnesses that we had really came forward out of, sense of, out of a sense of right and wrong. And um, I, I, they came to the agents 
most of the team was white. We had initially uh, a lawyer from the civil rights division who was black, who was helping us. But I really believe these witnesses that we talked to and that we saw in here, they were doing this out of the sense of right and wrong and how people changed, their hearts and minds had changed. But remember, we just didn't get any of the old Klansmen or their wives. And the, I think the wives knew as much as the men did, but we didn't get that. And, and we worked on them a lot. We went back and forth a lot, but we didn't get that. I, I really believe that the times had changed and people felt like they needed to do the right thing. And there's been a lot of these old civil rights cases, by the way, um, you know, 20 or 30 of them, most of them, almost all of them resulted in convictions. Jerry Mitchell's got a book out about several that he was involved with, and the murder of Medgar Evers, the murder of Vernon Dahmer, uh, some fascinating cases that have come down the pike uh, with these cold cases. The first bill that I introduced uh, in DC was the Civil Rights Cold Case Commission that the president's now appointed. I got it, we got it passed into law and uh, it's creating a commission to go and hopefully make public a lot of these records so that historians and educators and the media can look at a lot of these unsolved cases, whether it's Emmett Till, whether it's others to try to give some sense of healing and you know, reconciliation to the families. We have any last burning question? Okay, I'd like to thank the Senator. Thank you.